So we have all the candidates. Good evening to all of you uh, and good evening to our audience. My name is Andrew Bernstein and I'm gonna be serving as the moderator for the debate and discussion that we're gonna to have tonight. Uh, before we get into the uh, debate, I'd like to welcome you all, uh, welcome the candidates and welcome our audience uh, on behalf of B'nai B'rith. And uh, just before we get started, a couple of notes. Number one, B'nai B'rith has an elections guide so we urge our audience to Google it and look at the issues that are important to B'nai B'rith and hopefully important to you. And just another note uh, before we get started, uh, no matter who you vote for in the election, B'nai B'rith Canada wants you to vote no to Ben and Jerry's ice cream. Uh, ben and Jerry's is engaging in anti-Israel advocacy and singling out uh, Israel for treatment. So in the chat box, you'll see the, the, the um, link to the B'nai B'rith's campaign about writing your grocer and encouraging them to uh, stop carrying Ben and Jerry's because of their positions on Israel. Here's the format for this evening. Number one, each candidate's gonna have open, give an opening statement of two minutes. Number two, we're gonna have four questions uh, which have been prepared by B'nai B'rith. They've been shared with the candidates in advance. Each candidate will have two minutes to answer and then a 30 second rebuttal. I will be keeping time strictly because we want to get to as many uh, candidates as we possibly, uh, sorry, as many questions as we possibly can. After the four questions that are from B'nai B'rith, we will have questions from the audience. So if you have a question, if you're an audience member, put it in the chat box and I will do my best to get to your question. Can't promise I'll get to every single question, but we'll, we'll do our best. Um, <coughs> I guess it's good that we're not in person today. So uh, the other thing I would ask is make your questions about the issues. Uh, politics generates really strong emotions, but what we want to have tonight is respectful dialogue about the issues. I will also be vetting the questions for duplication. Now, with, with all of that uh, done, I'm going to introduce our candidates from this evening. Uh, good evening to all of you. We have Yara Sachs, from, who is a candidate for the Liberal Party. Good evening, Yara. We have <laughs> Joel, thank, thank you. We have Joel Yakov Atien. Joel is representing the Conservative Party of Canada. Good evening, Joel. Hello, Andrew. And we have Kamal Ahmed from the New Democratic Party. Hi, good evening, everyone. Good evening. Thanks for joining us to all three of you. We really appreciate your participating in this debate. We're going to start with opening statements, and each candidate has two minutes. I'm using my uh, phone alarm, it will quack at me when it's done. So please do, when you see me waving my phone around, please do stop, even if you're in the middle of a sentence, because we're going to try and run a tight ship time-wise and get to as many questions as we possibly can from our audience. Uh, Yara, you've been selected to go first. Two minutes starts now. Great. Thank you, Andrew. And thank you, Vinay Breath. And thank you to the other candidates who have joined this evening. It's really a pleasure to join all of you. And Shona Tova to everyone. So I'm Yara Sachs. I've had the honor of being your member of parliament here in York Centre for just under a year. And I thought it would be good to talk a little bit about myself and my background, especially given tonight's topics. Prior to being elected, I was a small business owner here in the riding, which I call home to myself and my two daughters, as well as help being the director of a local mental health charity here in North York. I'm a strong advocate for mental health resources, supporting the vulnerable, and also a strong advocate for a green innovation economy. And as you might know, I'm an Israeli-Canadian citizen, citizens of both countries. My father is Israeli, my mother is Canadian. I'm fluent in Ivrit, also speak some Arabic, et je travaille à améliorer, améliorer mon français. I did my master's degree at the Hebrew University of Jerusalem in international relations and diplomacy, and loved it so much during a critical time in the country that I stayed for over a decade and brought my first daughter into the world there. I know how strong the spiritual connection is for the Jewish people in relation to Israel and the Jewish community that we have here in York Center and from coast to coast to coast. I'm also an unapologetic Zionist. I oppose and condemn BDS, the movement as it is anti-Semitic, and I believe in strong Canada-Israel ties. My grandparents were Moshaniks, and my family still lives in the same farm and farming area outside of Tel Aviv today. During the month of May, most nights I didn't sleep, waiting to hear back from them that everyone was safe and well. 
waiting for updates from them to make sure everyone was all right. I've lived through the second Intifada, having survived a terrorist attack myself and losing friends at the Hebrew University attack. Needless to say, I understand the concerns of the community and the concerns for the safety of Israel and the impact of terrorism as I've experienced it firsthand. I know your fears. I've lived them myself and I will never forget them. Thank you very much, Yara. Uh, Joel, you're next. We're looking forward to hearing from you. Thank and you. And start. Mes amis, bonsoir. It's been a terrible and for much too many, a horrible 20 months. And I would like to first acknowledge your troubles and hardships and wish all of you a better new year. A Shana Tova, a Gamar Khatima Tova, a Gitio, a Gizintio to all. Je suis juif, I am a Jew, pro Zionist. Two little ones in our community day school system. Life at Chat, they go to school at Chat and Associated. And Life at Chat and Associated requires security guards at every door, on guard all day, every day. My grandfather was a rabbi who served in the French resistance during the war and came to Canada in 1964. My father was a Haitian political exile, an academic who faced torture in prison in Haiti. In the background of their, soft, their suffering and their trauma, I became a human rights lawyer. I was born and raised in New Brunswick. I came to York Center 23 years ago in a $300 Chevy Cavalier with only dreams to build a life and a family for myself. New York Center is a wonderful ecosystem and its MP is supposed to honor its community trust. We are home to Canada's largest Filipino community. We have substantive Italian community, a substantive Jewish community, a substantive Greek community, and live with many other wonderful peoples from all over the world. We are, also, we are supposed to be a beacon of freedom and opportunity to the world. I am running in this election because I'm concerned, concerned by the rise of anti-Semitism under Justin Trudeau. I am concerned by the rise in crime under Justin Trudeau. I am concerned with stagnation of upward mobility under Justin Trudeau. I want to secure Canada. We need to secure our future. I want a Canada that manufactures vaccines, that supplies PPEs when they are needed, and more importantly, I dream of a Canada that does not count and take direction from the planet's worst human rights violators. Your choice in this election is clear. More of the same, more uncertainty, lack of safety, or you can vote for someone who understands what keeps you up at night. Someone who will fight for a better future for you, your children and grandchildren every day. And okay. someone who will well, never- we're done, we're out of time. Thank you very much for your opening statement. Kamal, let's hear from you. We're looking forward to hearing your opening statement. Hey, thank you very much, Andrew, and, and thank you everyone for who's watching and to the candidates for the privilege to be in this space. Um, you know, my name is Kamal and I'm 27 years old. I previously was a software engineer in the uh, accessibility space and I, I work very closely with nonprofits and disabled folks and I am disabled myself. I have ADD and I like I, I used, I run a small business for this, and um, I'm, I'm living in Clanton Park, and uh, I think uh, the, the past few years have been fairly difficult during the pandemic and during the past uh, few governments, and I, I think that we are here as a community to, to see that change comes and. As a lover of democracy, I think we need a voice for local issues, including for this community here, for issues that are pertaining to the Jewish people, seeing that anti-Semitism is on the rise and it's a very important issue. So that as well as like issues pertaining to um, like Down to you Park things and Oh, somebody said they cannot hear me, so I will speak up a little bit. Um, and uh, I wanted to also say that I'm I'm from a mixed background. My 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 mom is from Indian descent; she's Sikh, and my dad is Pakistani. Um, and so I know, like diversity is in my blood. I was born in Mississauga, and um, you know the issues that I know and saw in this community are very important because our executive is primarily Jewish. So all these things thank that you. we, thank you. Thanks, Kamal. Yeah. I, I, uh, I hope everybody feels like everyone got cut off equally because that's what is going to happen if you go over the time. 
Um, but thank you. I really appreciate hearing from all of you. And I know our audience really appreciates hearing from all of you in your opening statements. Um, we're going to move now to the segment that is about prepared questions from B'nai B'rith. I'm going to read the question out loud to you. And then we're going to give each candidate two minutes to answer. And then everybody gets a 30 second rebuttal in the same order that they got the answer. So here's the first question from B'nai B'rith. Anti-Semitism in Canada is continuing to rise. The B'nai B'rith Canada 2020 annual audit of anti-Semitic incidents showed an increase of 18.3% compared to the last year. This past May, B'nai B'rith Canada reported an extremely disturbing surge of anti-Semitism stemming from the Hamas conflict with more than 250 known incidents, including assaults. So here's the questions for each candidate. What's your party's position on combating anti-Semitism? What will you do to ensure the safety of the Jewish community in your riding? And what's your position on the IHRA definition of anti-Semitism? Uh, Yara, you have two minutes and you get to go first. Just let me set my clock here. Go ahead. Thank you, Andrew. So I'm glad we're starting with this question first. The anti-Semitism we saw during the most recent conflict between Israel and Gaza was absolutely horrific. And what we witnessed in our city and our community and communities across Canada and frankly around the world was unacceptable and needs to change. I said then, and I say it now, the Jewish community safety here in York Center, Toronto and throughout Canada is never conditional on foreign events. I heard from neighbors, I heard from seniors, I heard from Holocaust survivors about the real vulnerability and palpable fear. And I worry about the impact on my daughters who attend local Jewish day schools here in the riding. Anti-Semitism was getting worse before the conflict, and we've really just seen the we're just seeing the true extent of the pro of the problem as it gets more and more pervasive. And we need to take action to combat it. This Liberal government was the first jurisdiction in Canada to adopt the IHRA in 2019, and I'm proud of that fact. We also more than quadrupled the funding for the security infrastructure program to protect at-risk community institutions, such as CHAT, where Joelle's daughters go, and mine. And like schools and synagogues, we saw the effectiveness of the SIP program, for example, at the arson on the Montreal Synagogue, in which the arsonist was stopped due to the cameras and the funding through the SIP grants. I absolutely support the IHRA definition. It's part of our official government anti-racism strategy, and it's being used to inform us how we identify and respond to the rise in anti-Semitism. Our government hosted the first ever national summit on anti-Semitism in July, to bring together government and stakeholders to look for true action and community leadership as we go forward. And we funded two projects here in the GTA through UJA Federation and LAAD Canada to ensure we enforce a combat online hate and also help police forces to keep communities safe. Our platform includes a national action plan on combating hate in all of its forms and will include an action plan on anti-Semitism with a commitment within the first hundred days. Okay, thank you very much. Yara. Joel, you're next. Let's hear, remember the questions. What's your party's position on combating anti-Semitism? What will you do to ensure the safety of the Jewish community in your writing? And your position on the IHRA definition of anti-Semitism. Thanks. After, after six years of Justin Trudeau's liberal government, are we safer or more secure? The answer is no. I must single out the appeasers and anti-Semites within, within the Justin Trudeau liberals. And to me, Jenica Atwin is the perfect example. This is what she did. Jenica Atwin was a Green MP from my home province of New Brunswick. This past June, Jenica Atwin was attacking Black and Jewish Green leader, Anna Mae Paul. Jenica Atwin was shouting loud and wide that Israel was an apartheid state. To say that is both anti-Semitic and racist in accordance with the IRA definition that the liberals adopted in 2009, but refused to respect. Because Green leader Anime Paul did not yield to Jenica Atwin's anti-Semitism, Jenica Atwin bolted to the Liberals and was welcomed with hugs and open arms by none other than your MP of almost 12 months, Yara Sachs. If I was in power with the Conservatives, a Busha or Shanda like this would never happen. The York Center, York Center MP must defend all its constituents, including 20% of its population who are Jewish. It's a community trust. We would fight alongside the community as did, under, as, as did Stephen Harper. Yara, how can you say you stand up against anti-Semitism when your seatmate is an anti-Semite and you welcomed her to your party with open arms? 
And by the way, please don't say that you spoke to her about it and explain how she was wrong, because two days later, later, Jenica Atwin went on TV and doubled down on her position on Israel. Not to mention, Jenica felt it important to tell the media that there are many people in your caucus who agree with her. How many anti-Semites are in your caucus, Yara? Five, 10, 15, how many? We're gonna get Kamal uh, next, and then we will give each candidate an opportunity to respond for 30 seconds. So uh, Kamal, again, just to remind you of the questions, what's your party's position on combating anti-Semitism? What will you do to ensure the safety of the Jewish community in your writing? And what's your position on the IHRA definition? I just also want to review my, I just want to, uh, sorry, remind our viewers that you can put and you should put uh, questions into the chat. We would love to see your questions and we'll definitely have enough time for four or five of them. So put questions in the chat. Um, Kamal, let's hear from you. Thank you. Sure, thank you. Um, under this government, there has been a rise in race-based hate in this riding, targeting the Jewish community, Muslim community, Black community, and Indigenous community. And this is intolerable. This rise is extremely worrisome. I'm very preoccupied just thinking about it. Um, our leader has experienced racialized hate. Our campaign team, even during this can campaign, while canvassing, have experienced anti-Semitism. And I have experienced race-based hate. So we want to develop a national strategy to fight this hate, these hate crimes uh, in part with an online task force. So this is like, it's why I'm deeply committed to working with everyone here and even on how to stem this rise in hate. We, we need to work within every community and because yeah, this is not the Canada we want. And th there is a link between different type of race-based hate um, so we do not support the IHRA definition for only one reason. The current definition has created concern over how it's interpreted and how it affects people who want to have the freedom to criticize the actions of Israel, which affects the Palestinians on the occupied lands, which violates the Palestinians' human rights. And while it seems okay, it's it has generated discussion on, uh, on these, these issues. So moving forward, we hope to work with the IHRA to address these concerns on this definition because all human rights should be defended. That's like the most three common, three most common words of 2020 and 2021, you're on mute. Um, so, uh, we're going to give each candidate 30 seconds to respond. I somehow I'm going to get this alarm stuff going. Uh, we're going to get each candidate 30 seconds to respond in the same order in which they spoke originally. So Yara, uh, we would ask that you go first. You have 30 seconds. Um, let's hear from you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I haven't heard from Mr. Etienne how he intends to, um, to propose to address anti-Semitism other than me. We have a comprehensive platform. The conservative platform says nothing but anti Semitism will be at all interested in us in Canada. So I would like him to answer that. In terms of his colleagues in caucus, I have not one, not two, not three, maybe four um, George Soros conspiracy theorists who have attacked us in the House consistently with anti Semitism conspiracy theories. How do you intend to address that, Mr. Tim? And our foreign that, minister. That, that, Yara, that's your 30 seconds. Sorry. Uh, Joel, you've got 30 seconds. Go ahead. Yara, you sit beside an anti-Semite in the House of Commons. How many more Jenica Atwins are in your caucus? How many anti-Semites? Yara, how many? Yara, you don't have the monopoly on being Israeli. While you were using your power to fund UNRWA and living under Canada's veil of safety, my mother was in Israel, not in Renana, but in Batyam, and spent weeks taking shelter. I've seen the selfies with the fear in her eyes. The conservatives support IRA. The liberals say they do, but, you, but your embrace of your seatmate, Jenica Atwin, proves your party does the opposite of what you say and promise. Aaron O'Toole recognizes that the quiet acceptance of anti-Zionism has found a place in newsrooms. When okay, Israel Joel, that's your, your 30 seconds are up. Thank you. 
Yeah, Come we on. should. Yeah, we should not just be using this issue for partisan and political gain. Like we should be working together for peace and human rights. And the liberals have always just been working in their own best interests. And we need we need a change. We need somebody who's actually working for all of us for this local community in York Center. Okay, thank you, Kamal. Um, just to the candidates, I'm going to ask another question. But and I know, of course, politics uh, gets everybody's blood boiling. But let, let's do our best to um, not engage in finger pointing. And th what our audience really wants to hear today is the, about the issue. What what is your party going to do to deal with various issues? And and so uh, I'm not going to stop you. You can use your time however you like. But I know from some comments that we're getting in the chat and, and from having been a, part, a viewer myself, what we're really most interested in is policy. And, and, and so I'm going to read the next question. Kamal, you're going to go first, then Yara, then Joel. Um, and again, what I what we really like to hear from you is, is, is policy answers to policy questions. So uh, here's the question. And uh, unlike the others, I'm not going to read it uh, for, for each of you. So uh, listen carefully the first time. Over the past few years, and particularly during the COVID-19 crisis, the cost of housing in Canadian cities has continued to rise rapidly. This has had the effect of pushing low-income families and even young professionals out of the housing market. What steps does your party propose to make um, to take to make home ownership a more achievable goal, both for young professional couples and for families whose only current option is to rent? Kamal, you have two minutes, and let's hear from you. Thanks. Yeah, thank you. I'm. I mean, so as I said before, I'm a 27-year-old millennial. I just got married last year. So this is a very key issue to me. Many of my friends and my family members have been unable to purchase their first homes. And the price of housing over the past with, with the past government has gone up over $300,000 and nothing has been done. Our plan is to build 500,000 affordable homes across Canada. Um, many of the other plans, uh, I'm trying not to finger point, have been for affordable housing that's actually above market value, which does not make sense. Um, they, they focus on helping landlords and investors of housing. And, um, you know, some, some candidates are, are house flippers in other parties. And I think we need people who, are actually, who actually have skin in the game, with, who, to, if you want to trust this very important housing crisis. Okay, hey, thank you very much. Um, Yara, you, you're next. You have two minutes to talk about housing policy. Let's hear from you. Thanks, Thanks, Andrew. So over the past 18 months, we've seen the cost of housing explode across Canada. It was already expensive in Toronto before, but now it's out of reach for young people. Come on, I'll agree with you on that. We've had to work, we've had to save. I live in a condo with my two daughters. I couldn't afford a home. And like many of us, I, I want to live close to my parents and, and my family who live here in Bathurst Manor as well. And um, they're an essential part of my support network as a single mom. But I worry about my kids' ability to afford the same, even in a condo. What if they have to move out of the city to Bowmanville or Hamilton or further to afford a home? And how would they be able to be connected to my mom or have a connection to me and their own children? Owning a home should not be out of reach, and we know that in renting has also become so expensive that renters can't save either, and we all deserve the same opportunities, just like the generations before us. That's why we actually have a plan to unlike home ownership by helping renters to own and put saving for a down payment faster through the, for, with up to $30,000 through a home buyer's plan and account. We want to build 1.4 million more homes in four years to help increase supply and a home buyer's bill of rights to make sure that the buying process becomes fairer, more transparent, and ensures that homes are for Canadian families. That includes banning blind bidding and establishing the legal right to a home inspection. If we're gonna build a better and more equal future for everyone, then we have to make sure that young people who are trying to build and save for their lives have the same opportunities that our parents did. There's no silver bullet for this in making housing more affordable, but we are the only party with a real plan that will help ensure that all Canadians can get a home of their own. Okay, thank you very much, Yara. Uh, Joel, uh, housing policy, let's hear it. Thank you. 
Jews can live anywhere in our beautiful country, in Happy Valley Goose Bay, in Sudbury, but the ecosystem of Jewish community life that is York Center took more than a century to build and is now transferable. If Justin Trudeau and the Liberal Party were serious about making housing affordable for us and our children, he would not have called this election. By the way, this election is costing all of us $660 million. That is $660 million that could have been spent on affordable housing. Instead, we are in the midst of the most expensive vanity project for Justin Trudeau we have seen in his six years of power. It's the Gaiva. Not to mention, he admitted that if he doesn't get the majority he wants, guess what? Another election in 18 months. I guess Yara Sachs' solution for housing is for our kids to move to Fredericton, where Jenica Adwin comes from. We want our kids, if they want to, to have the opportunity to live within the ecosystem of our Jewish communities, close to our schools and shoals and close to us. Instead of working on these important issues, Justin Trudeau is sitting by while our kids have to move to Jedekah at Wins Fredericton because it's the only place they'll be able to afford to live. Again, Yara, why are we spending $660 million on the election instead of putting that money into our community? Why are you going to push a 15% tax on housing? Full stop. A starting lawyer in York Center today earns the same pay that I started with 20 years ago. Housing prices, though, are 10 times what they were when I first started. Okay, so we, each candidate now has 30 seconds to respond. Kamal, uh, let's hear from you. You've got 30 seconds, go ahead. Yeah, so the increased supply that the liberals want to do is does not necessarily mean lower prices and somebody needs to have the guts to be able to pay for that and that's gonna be through a wealth tax. And, you know, our community, as Chan said, uh, like we have to live near, like many Jewish people live near synagogues and when the housing prices go up, it, you have to go north. So the liberal plan to help investors and landlords isn't going to save that. Okay, thank you. Yara, 30 thank seconds. You. Go ahead. Thanks, Andrew. So I guess Joel really doesn't have a policy plan because he didn't mention one. He also doesn't live in York Center, so he doesn't really understand what the housing costs here for our community. And frankly, um, the lies continue about the, the Conservatives saying that we are going to tax primary residences, which we have said unequivocally that we're not. So again, Joel, I'll ask you, what's your housing policy plan? Just like, what's your policy plan for anti-Semitism? You're busy attacking me, but you're actually not giving the participants who have taken precious time to be here to know what your policy plan is. Thanks, Yara. Joel, you're, you have 30 seconds. Our community wants to stay together. For me, building a family and a business in the ecosystem called York Center has been 23 years of my life, working 20 hour days. So I care about this community. I want my kids to be able to stay here. Under Justin Trudeau and Yara Sack, they will not be able to. Yara, why are you spending $660 million on a vanity election for Justin Trudeau instead of working on behalf of the hardworking people of York Center? Okay, um, I'm just going to remind all of the candidates here. Um, I'm the one asking the questions. So uh, I, we really want to hear concrete policy proposals. Um, there's lots of comments in the chat about uh, actually having people answer the questions. And I really want to encourage all of our candidates to answer the questions. Um, let's get to the next one, because this is really important and we'd really like to hear from all of you substantively. Canada is a strong voice to the United Nations for tolerance and peace. However, a strong anti-Israel bias permeates the UN and its agencies. Often this anti-Israel bias morphs into blatant anti-Semitism. Last month, a report found dozens of teachers at UN Relief and Work Agency schools condoned violence and spread anti-Semitism online. Another report showed uh, UNRWA textbooks denying Israel's existence and glorifying terror. What steps would your government take to ensure that no Canadian taxpayers uh, dollars go towards UN programs that demonize Israel and Jews? Joel, you're first this time. You have two minutes. Go ahead. Stephen Harper cut UNRWA funding because he saw through the veil of smiles and handshakes that Justin Trudeau fell for. Since being elected, Justin Trudeau immediately resumed funds that went directly towards building the terror tunnels, launching pads, and funding rockets that were tar targeting my own mother who lives in Tel Aviv. $90 million over three years announced in March. 
90 days after Yara became an MP. Three months before, before Yara and Justin welcomed Jenica Atwin with open arms as their new partner in Middle Eastern affairs. UNRWA equals terror in Israel, full stop. In the summer, when rockets were falling up and down in Israel, yet again, rockets were being launched from UNRWA schools. In the past 72 hours, rockets have fallen on Israel. Yara, I can't wait to hear your friends in caucus, Jenica Atwin, single out Israel for defending themselves. Should they need to? The choice is clear. Justin Trudeau, Yara Sack, and Jenica Atwin, who are willing to sell out Israel and other allies in order to get a seat at the UN Security Council, which Trudeau never got, by the way, or the principal friendship through fire and water of the Conservative Party. The Conservative Party will never support a UN motion that singles out Israel. Yara, can you say the same? Yara, I've asked this already, but I will ask again. How many rockets and terror attacks need to happen before we hear from another anti-Semite in your caucus? How could you sit by and watch your party sell out the state of Israel? Uh, Julie, you have 30 seconds left. Do you want to take any of that time? I'm good, thank you. Okay. <coughs> Pardon me. Uh, Kamal, you're next here. Let's hear from you. Uh, you have two minutes. Go ahead. Thank you. Um, UNRWA was established for relief of displaced Palestinians. However, no organization should implicate itself in the spreading of misinformation. All organizations should be held accountable on anything done that contravenes their own mandate. They should be held accountable. And we also recognize that they've provided essential services for over 5 million Palestinian re refugees who remain stateless to this day. So the solution is not to dismantle international organizations who have done good work. We need to hold organizations accountable and make sure that they're transparent. We need to ensure and make sure that all of their programming and their actions are consistent with their own UN mandates. That's right, that's their own mandate too. Um, and th you know they already have these mandates not to do these things and they're being left to be corrupt. So, you know, we, we need to hold them to these standards. Hey, you have a bit of time left. Do you have anything else you wanted to say? Uh, no. Okay. Yara, uh, Anwa. Thanks, Andrew. Thanks so much. So I think we're all in agreement that the anti-Israel bias of the UN bodies is shameful and is unacceptable. And we're all in agreement that there's a need for accountability and transparency when it comes to that. And that's why our government, like previous governments before us with values-based policy has some of the toughest contracts for funders throughout any of, our, any of their UN partner countries to which even NGO monitor Gerald Steinberg has acknowledged that. But let's also be clear that in, you know, since the six years that we've been in government, we've only voted in favor of two general assembly resolutions supporting a two-state solution. In terms of other times where specific targeted resolutions against Israel, we voted 83 times in support of Israel. Let's look at the conservative government's record when it was 84 times, Israel was opposed 84 times, 30 times the conservative government voted in favor of opposing Israel. So our record is clear. Joel, let's agree that we both support Israel rather than attacking one another. But on UNRWA, like any other funding body, we have a responsibility as a value-based foreign policy country to support those who are vulnerable throughout the world with accountability. And we know that UNRWA has serious issues that need fixing, but we can't do it if we're not sitting at the table. I shudder to think who else would take our place and other funders' place in educating over 500,000 Palestinian children if we were not at the table ensuring neutrality education. Yes, there's work to be done. I'm committed to that work, as is our government. But to pull the plug on it would be completely contrary to what the State of Israel has asked us to do, what UN Watch asks us to do, and even Sija, who understands the importance of UNRWA's work. So let's do active and positive policy rather than shutting down important frameworks to help those who are most vulnerable in the world. Thanks, Sarah. Um, Joel, you have 30 seconds to respond. Go ahead. The choice is clear, folks. The principal stand of the Conservative Party, which has been proven through our record throughout the Harper years, government, or the liberals who sell out their friends and the state of Israel for self-gain at, at, at the first opportunity that they get. Uh, 
I mean, yeah, Yara, you, you say you are Israeli, but all these Israeli institutions, well, you know, uh, uh, have, have, have difficulties with UNRWA. Uh, uh, UNRWA equals terror. Uh, uh, thanks, terror thanks, Joel. Yeah. thanks, Joel. Tamal, you have 30 seconds. Go ahead. I, I question the Liberals' ability to hold the organizations accountable when literally in Downsview Park, we have people protesting because $150 million was spent on a school with an aviation campus, and they literally let the Bombardier sell the runway for an aviation campus. So if you want to talk about accountability and transparency, we need people like me who have done accessibility all the time for many large organizations. I can do this. Thank you. Yara, last 30 seconds to you. So firstly, um, Stephen Harper is not the Prime Minister, it's Aaron O'Toole and the CPC, and the Conservatives under Harper voted against Israel 30 times, 30 times. In terms of accountability and UNRWA, as an Arabic speaker, I've worked hand in hand with the Impact Say report and with Minister Gould's team to ensure that every page of that curriculum was reviewed, vetted, and returned with corrections. And in terms of indiscriminate rocket fire and supporting Israel, I'd encourage Joel to check May 12th, May 14th, May 16th, and May 27th, when the Canadian government stood firmly with Israel against indiscriminate rocket fire. Okay, from thank Hamas. you. Thank you, Yara. So yeah. just to respond, um, there's been a few comments in the chat asking whether some people had the questions in advance. So all candidates received the B'nai B'rith questions in advance. So there was no, um, it, there was no, leaks or preferred access. Everybody got the questions in advance. They had an opportunity to provide their answers um, and, and prepare their answers. We will be getting to some questions from the audience in the chat at the end. And certainly you'll have an opportunity to hear the candidates, um, you know, in a more, perhaps more spontaneous manner. But uh, everybody had the questions in advance. We wanted the candidates to be thinking about these issues. After all, policy isn't made in a, in a 30 second snippet. So, um, I, for one, appreciate the candidate's preparation. Uh, let, let, here's the fourth question from Vinay Breath, and then we'll get to some questions from the audience. As the world's leading state sponsor of terrorism, Iran has supplied arms, personnel, training, and finances to various proxies in the Middle East and throughout the world. Much of its operations are conducted through the Islamic Revolutionary Guard Corps, which was also responsible for downing the Ukrainian passenger jet, resulting in many Canadian lives lost. The Islamic Republic has provoked and exacerbated conflicts that have resulted in mass civilian casualties, displacement, and destruction of infrastructure. What's your party's view on Canada-Iran relations? Do you accept the, that the entirety of the Islamic Revolutionary Guard Corps should be designated a terrorist entity as called for in a motion adopted by the House? Two minutes each. Yara, we're back to you. Go ahead. So first, I want to be clear off the top that the Liberals unreservedly condemn the Iranian regime for its terrible human rights violations against the Iranian people. We also condemn its, its actions in destabilizing the Middle East. We reject and condemn its threats and denials of Israel's right to exist. We reject and condemn its imprisonment and role in the death of Canadians. We reject and condemn its state sponsorship and export of terrorism, and we condemn an, uh, we condemn an outcry, its attack on flight PS752 that killed 55 Canadians and 30 permanent residents. And we continue to list Iran as a state sponsor of terror, and ha we have strict sanctions in place, including listing the IRGC Al-Quds Force as a terrorist organization. The Prime Minister said, and I quote, we deeply oppose Iran's support for terrorist organizations, its threats towards Israel, its ballistic missile program, and its support for the murderous assault Assad regime. We will always defend human rights and hold Iran to account for its actions from Prime Minister Trudeau. But since 20, 2003, Ken has continuously been the lead sponsor in the annual UN resolution on the situation of human rights in Iran. And this was started by a liberal government, government and then continued by both conservative and liberal, subsequent liberal governments. On flight PS752, we have more work to do, absolutely. And we're working with our international partners to hold Iran accountable for the illegal shoot down of that plane and to continue to support the families and loved ones of the victims as they continue to fight for justice and reparations. You're on mute, Andrew. <laughs> Oh, no. Funny story, I've got a bit of a cough. 
So I had to put myself on mute, A, so I don't cough to you, but also so that I had to scream to my kids, can somebody come refill my water bottle, please? <laughs> so you can't see her, but I was saying what was my 14 year old daughter. Anyway, so, so, so sorry about that, folks. Joel, a two minutes on Iran and Canadian Iran relations. I'm very interested in hearing from you. They murder around the world and they money launder and terrify their own expats here in Toronto, but only liberal appeasement. Yes, let's call a terrorist a terrorist. Unlike Yara and the Liberal Party, I and the Conservative Party are not apologize, apologists for the anti-Semites. The Conservative Party introduced a motion which passed in 2018 to list the IRGC as a terrorist entity, and Yara's Liberal Party have yet to list them as, a, as a, all of them. Persian-Canadian journalist Zara Kazemi was murdered in 2003 by the Revolutionary Guard, but in six years in power, only liberal appeasement. PS 572, Ukraine air flight, 55 Canadian citizens and 30 permanent residents dead. Not a good day when an uncle walks into your office to see you as a human rights lawyer and tells you his nephew lost his wife and children, but only liberal appeasement. Not a good day when Persian human rights activists tell you that they are afraid uh, the, the revolutionary, revolutionary guards here in Toronto of them, too afraid to even canvas with you because the revolutionary guards have no problem settling scores and fostering a climate of fear and violence against their own diaspora here in our streets, but only liberal appeasement. The revolutionary guards, these are people who openly call for the destruction of the state of Israel and the massacre of Jewish people. Yara, your party has had since 2018 to list the IR IRGC as a terrorist organization. And instead, you're looking for opportunities to hold hands and work together. You've had a year to deliver, and you, and you still, still you come to us empty-handed. Why? How much more Iran-sponsored terror must the people of Israel endure while your party does nothing? What day, exact, what day exactly will your party wake up and decide to be principled for the first time and finally list the IRGC as a terrorist organization? What day? When? Okay. Uh, Kamal. A uh, question for you about the Islamic Revolutionary Guard Corps and designation as a terrorist entity and Canadian-Iranian relations. Go ahead. Yeah, there must be a zero tolerance for violations of human rights. And when innocent Canadians are victims to these violations, Canada needs to take a strong stance in our defense. We owe it to our loved ones that we have a strong Canada that defends Canadians at home and abroad which is why the IRGC must be held accountable. We condemn it in the strongest way. Iran's interference of other countries and incitement of violence in and out of their borders, it's, it's, it's horrendous. Our, our government has so far has been very timid in their dealings with Iran. The behavior on this file has been similar to the behavior on other dealings, quite frankly. It's more posturing than taking actions. They prefer symbolism to actually meaningful action. I, I'm tired of seeing us sit on the sidelines, having decisions made for us, and which is partly why I'm here today. We, we need somebody who wants to take action. Um, you know, I, I don't think that personally I'm, I'm qualified to take a stance on whether this motion should be adopted by the House of Commons, but I trust that uh, Jagmeet Singh will seek advice before we make that call. Okay. Uh, Yara, you have 30 seconds to respond. Thanks, Andrew. So as I said previously, we unequivocally condemn the Iranian regime. And I think we need to be aware of simplistic slogans and throwing out politicization while not recognizing the important work of national, national security processes. Terrorist groups are listed by the government on the advice of our national security professionals who need to do their work without undue influence or interference. I don't second guess them. I'm not really sure why the conservatives or Joel Etienne are. We need to trust the process as they continue to list month after month, week after week, year after year, Al-Quds Brigade and other, other organizations. Okay, thank you, Yara. Joel? How much longer, sorry? Go ahead. Sorry about that. Sorry, Andrew. How much longer will the Liberal Party dance around calling a terrorist a terrorist? When will the Liberal Party list the IRGC as a terrorist organization? You've had since 2018. When? We need to hold the Iranian regime accountable for its reckless nuclear ambitions, 
malevolent state support of international terrorism and human rights violations. We need to impose Magnitsky sanctions on gross human rights violators. We need to fulfill the motion adopted by parliament and designate the IRGC as a terrorist entity. And we shouldn't just be deferring to allegedly the civil service. I mean, that's just not an excuse. Thank you. Um, Kamal, you get the last word on this subject. I'm having a little bit of a camera issue here. So I'm gonna see if I can de-blur my camera. You guys can't see my boyish good looks when it's blurry like this. So uh, let's give that a try. And uh, Kamal, go ahead. You've got 30 seconds. All right, um, you know, we're talking about trust here and how, how can I even trust you uh, that you'll listen to voices when you won't even respond to mine? Like I represent a large number of people in this writing, and I, 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 I'm advocating on their behalf for Canada, who's active and vigilant to hold Iran accountable for what has been done. We don't need empty threats or meaningless posturing. We need a commitment to do what's right. Okay. So thanks, everybody. That ends the uh, pre-planned questions part of the segment. Um, take a sip of water. Move your arms around. Uh, I'm just going to, uh, I'm looking through the chat to look for some of the questions that people have asked. I think we're going to spend our first question, and so the format's the same, two minutes per person, rotating order, and then a 30 second rebuttal. Uh, but I think we're gonna spend our first question on the issues of around vaccination and the pandemic. Obviously COVID-19, <laughs> has been uh, a difficult time for everybody. Um, vaccines have certainly been one way out of the pandemic. A few of the questions in the chat have been, where do you stand on third doses? And where do you stand on vaccine mandates? So Joel, go ahead and I'm gonna get some more. Uh, where do I stand on vaccines? Well, I've, I've, got, I've got my two doses. Uh, I shed, a, I shed a tear when I finally got my dose. Um, it's, uh, I, would have, I would have taken the Sputnik had that been available, but unfortunately it, it just wasn't. Uh, back in January, February and March, while, while other folks in Western countries had access to uh, timely vaccines. Uh, my clients who are essential workers, who, live, who work in factories, uh, who work as uh, uh, PSWs and, and long-term care facilities, et cetera. They just basically had, had, had no vaccines. And obviously before that, they didn't have any PP, PPEs on time. They didn't have any masks on time, completely because of the negligence and the incompetence of, as far as I'm concerned, the, the Yarosak Liberal Party. And so uh, I, I believe in vaccines. I'm happy to be vaccinated. I would take the sort of third shot today if it was available to me. I'm a pudgy 47-year-old racialized Canadian. It's people like me who were, who were dying in hospitals, who look like me who were dying in hospitals back uh, uh, a few months ago. People who didn't have access to, uh, who didn't have access to sick days uh, because the Trudeau government didn't have any money. But now they have actually have money for a $660, $660 million for an actual election. So um, I, I guess that answers the question. In terms of vaccine mandates, we're, we're following the guidelines of, 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 of Yarosak's own government, their own civil service are saying that, uh, uh, that obviously people should be vaccinated. It shouldn't be forced on people. And the practical reality is that it's, uh, it's, it's marginalized, uh, visible minorities, uh, indigenous Canadians, uh, the poor, the people without papers, uh, are the ones who who uh, who need encouragement to get vaccines, and um, the Trudeau government has been really intent on on creating a divided society, a divisive society, uh, turning 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 its uh, turning a uh, turning its uh, turning it, turning its head in relation to uh, vulnerable Canadians, and uh, I think that's what that's where they're headed with the mandates. We're out of time for you, Joel. Um, Kamal, you're next on this question. Uh, again, the questions are. Where do you stand on third doses and where do you stand on vaccine mandates? Yeah, um, so I, I think vaccines are very effective. I, I've been double dosed since since June. I, I am in a family of pharmacists who are very pro-vaccine. We got it a while ago. Um, and I think that uh, we, we need a thorough plan then. We need to be able to plan for how we'll handle future doses as well as other vaccines for other other diseases um 
but and we need vaccine passports to give businesses power to be able to protect their employees if they want the choice to do so um i think that uh, actually we have a we have a facility on our in our riding uh, that is developing vaccines and i think that we should continue to help them uh, create booster doses and other future doses okay Thank you, Kamal. Uh, Yara, as soon as I get the timing down right, you will have an opportunity. You have two minutes. And again, where do you stand on vaccine mandates? Where do you stand on third doses? Thanks so much. So in terms of third doses, we know that we have more than enough supply for booster doses if needed. Minister Anand has made that crystal clear. In fact, we have enough supply that we've been able to help other countries because we know that no one is safe until we are all vaccinated. Um, and that takes leadership and Canada has shown leadership in vaccines through COVAX and other funds. And here in Canada, we showed leadership here in York Centre by ensuring 415 million went into Sanofi for vaccine production. And we were also two months ahead of schedule in our delivery of vaccines to Canadians. But as always, we follow the science and where third doses will go will be based on what science says and what our most vulnerable need, which is what we've done all along. Um, in terms of how are we following the guidelines? Well, Mr. Etienne felt free to uh, canvas with Mr. Baber, who doesn't believe in masks or lockdowns. Um, and he has fellow caucus candidates who aren't vaccinated and going into long-term care homes. So I'd like to ask him how he, he supports no mandate in not keeping Canadians safe. Um, on, my, on my perspective, vaccines are effective. We know they are, we're following the science. We wanna ensure that every Canadian who wants a vaccine can have one. We actually ran two undocumented clinics here in York Centre to ensure that everyone, legal or illegally in this country, for whatever reasons that they are here, would be able to have a vaccine to keep their loved ones safe. I don't hear any efforts from Mr. Etienne on, on how we address the most vulnerable and going forward in vaccine production, but I support third doses and a vaccine mandate to keep all of us safe. Thank you, Yara. Joel? You have 30 seconds to respond. Yara, you, you're in office, you're an MP, and your government was negotiating the production of vaccine with the, the Chinese Communist Party. Other governments were paying three times the price uh, and, and getting the vaccine, which was one week of their economies on the basis that they had a diverse population. We, had a, we have a fantastic diverse population. Your vaccines were two months early. They were, they were three months, four months late because you didn't have the manufacturing, you couldn't produce it, and you weren't willing to pay what needed to be, to be paid for the vaccines. I've seen, I've seen clinics, I've seen James Pasternak with pictures at every clinic, but I haven't seen you around with respect to uh, the clinics and, and working in relation to getting people vaccinated. We're, you're done, Joel, thank you. Kamal, 30 seconds to talk about uh, vaccines. Thank you. Um, I believe very strongly about practicing what you preach. And uh, in our campaign, we, we didn't bring volunteers into buildings and we primarily phone canvas because we wanted to keep them safe because the, the vaccines do need boosters. They need, need, there aren't enough. They are important and effective, but they, they, we will need boosters over time. So, I mean, I think it's very important. I live with an elderly, my great aunt, and if I get sick, then she's gonna get sick. Okay. Thank you so much, Kamal. Yara? So I'm just gonna circle back on the vaccine mandates. It requires leadership to ensure that all of us as a community take care of one and each other. We are all responsible for one another, and that's why vaccine mandates are so important. Okay. Okay, thank you. We're going to move on from vaccines now. And again, um, <clears throat> lots of people are kind of venting in the chat, and I uh, can't stop you, but what we're really interested in seeing in the chat is uh, substantive questions. I do have another substantive question for you all. <coughs> the next question is about seniors issues and somebody put in the chat a question about what your party if elected government would do to support Canada's seniors who certainly have had a difficult uh, certainly had a difficult pandemic. So Kamal you're first this time. Um, let's hear from you two minutes on uh, how the, an NDP government would support seniors. Sure thank you and again as I said before like I live with my great aunt who she has a lot of needs, and so our plan for universal head-to-toe health care, including teeth, including pharma care, 
including mental health. Those are things that she has to pay out of pocket. And with a $700 pension, it's not a lot. Um, that in combination with um, like with protecting pensions from when, when companies uh, you know, fall apart. This is the reality, and we want to be able to protect those pensions uh, through an insurance type plan. And the, the last part that I wanted to talk about was about having a universal basic income that also applies to seniors because, quite frankly, their pensions are usually not enough. So um, this is a very, very important issue to me. Okay. Uh, you have an extra minute if you need one. So is there anything else that we, you, no pressure. You, you do not have to take all of your time. We're, we're happy to, to burn it up on something else. But if there's, is there anything else you wanted to talk about? Uh, sure, yeah, actually, yeah. So, I mean, I think accessibility uh, is something which is incredibly important to me and affects all seniors all over the place. Even this exact meeting, I asked for closed captions and nobody gave it to me. Yet my grandma who has hearing issues will not be able to understand it. So great aunt, sorry. So these are issues that are systemic that um, you know we're, we're working on it. And I have done great lengths to change the entire party's policies to be more accessible. So I really know that I can extend that to other, the actual government. Okay, thank you very much, Mal. Yara? Uh, you're next here. Again, the topic is seniors' issues. How would a liber liberal government support seniors' issues? So for many of us, seniors' issues were top of mind over the last 18 months, um, particularly in terms of their vulnerability and in long-term care homes. And we stood up time and again to assist long-term care homes by bringing in the Red Cross and the military when needed, when the provincial health systems just couldn't keep up. Um, but we make commitments going forward because our seniors have worked hard and they deserve a good and protected and safe life as they age well, which commit, we've committed to a 10% already before an election, we committed to a 10% increase to the OAS. We ensured that seniors had a $500 top up in August for those who needed it. And we also are starting the Aging Well program. We know that many seniors want to age well at home. We want to provide funding and tax credits to ensure that homes can be retrofitted so that seniors can stay in their homes longer where they feel comfortable and where they feel safe. But we also know that long-term care homes need an overhaul, which is why we are putting forward national standards for long-term care, working with the provinces where we can to ensure that there's a standard of excellence for our seniors and not meeting a basic minimum. But we also know they have needs, medical needs. Uh, you know, Kamal alluded to pharmacare. We've already, we've been doing a pharmacare study for over two years with Dr. Rick Hoskins. It's now available, it's now been completed and we've started signing contracts with PEI the first on the way, knowing that we need to make healthcare costs more affordable to Canadians, including our seniors. They're a top priority for us, just as they are for our community here in York Centre, where we have a large aging demographic. And I'm committed to and have been doing the work to make sure our seniors age well and live well. Thank you, Yara. Joel, I don't, I don't know why that was so difficult for me, but um, anyway, it's clearly you, it's your turn. And we're very much looking forward to hearing about how a conservative government would support seniors. Well, thank you, sir. Um, you, you, you've heard y Yara speak and uh, she's talking to you about, about studies. They had six years to put the standards and their studies together and get the job done, just didn't. Uh, and, and we saw what happened with our long-term care infrastructure during the pandemic. I mean, the, the seniors were, were, were hurt and harmed the most. What happened to them was atrocious and appalling and uh, inexcusable. Uh, we, we've got concrete plans to come with help. We're going to fix long-term care. We're going to devote $3 billion to infrastructure over the next three years to re renovate long-term care facilities across the country. We're going to protect, protect pe uh, pensions for seniors. We're going to uh, increase the, uh, the, rate, the, the rate of speed with respect to immigration processing for PSWs to come from overseas in order to come to Canada and come to the rescue and help the seniors that need the help. The price of food, the price of gas, seniors have fixed income and, and prices of inflation is going through the roof under Yara Sachs uh, and the Liberals. We're going to double the Canada workers benefit up to a maximum of $2,800 for individuals, 5,000 for families. So we're coming with some concrete steps and concrete help for our seniors 
And uh, we are not, we, we, are, we are certainly uh, in contrast with the liberals who say, 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 don't do, do, do. We're coming with a plan from day one to, uh, to come to the rescue. Okay. So every candidate now has 30 seconds to respond to each other. Kamal, uh, go ahead. And thank you. Um, yeah, and thank you for reminding me Yara, about the long term care guidelines. I really think that that's something which we connect on and that it's very important that we make those uh, the guidelines stronger and hold them accountable. Uh, it's also important that we make them public, but PharmaCare from PEI, from my experience, I talked to disabled people in PEI, they said that it only covers $50 medication, which is quite frankly nothing. Um, and this $500 top up doesn't even call it cover a month's rent. It kind of just is a vote by. Yara, you're next. So I'm disappointed that Joel is running for federal uh, government and doesn't understand how the federal provincial relationship works. Um, if we look at the Ford and the Kennedy gover uh, Keenan governments on uh, their cuts to seniors over the last four years plus, um, we know exactly how we wound up here in long term care and seniors. So making promises um, to fix things at the top when you're not willing to work with the provinces to get it done uh, sounds a little bit, uh, a lot of fantasizing and not real policy or action. Okay, and the last word goes to you, Joel. Uh, Yara knows very well that uh, it's not the cities or the provinces who have the money when it comes to can Canadian federalism. It's the federal government. The deaths, the deaths and the harm in the, across the LTC infrastructure across the country was across the country, notwithstanding any of the provincial governments. They had the money. They decided to keep it. They didn't spend it. They didn't spend it because now they're spending it on a $660 million. Uh, the is cut, they never spend. Okay. Well, uh, I, I will ask the candidates to please not cut into each other's time, but everyone will get a chance to speak and everyone will get a, a closing statement, but uh, that is the end of your time uh, there, Joel. Um, so we've got a few other questions to ask here. Uh, one is about mental health and supporting mental health. It was one of the very first questions in the chat, which was, you know, everybody I think has observed that mental health has suffered uh, since the pandemic. And we're quite interested in knowing uh, what, a part, what a government that your party creates or what a liberal NDP or conservative government would do to help Canadians and help support them. So uh, I've got Joel down for the first one here. Uh, Joel, go ahead. Well, we're coming with a lot of concrete, concrete help. We have a Canada Mental Health Action Plan. We're going to massively boost, boost health transfers to the provinces by at least 6% annually, doubling the Liberal commitment and representing nearly $60 billion for health care over the next 10 years. We're going to work with the provinces to invest in mental health as the priority it is, with the goal of private providing enough funding through health transfers for an additional million Canadians to receive mental health treatment every year. We're going to encourage employers to add mental health coverage to their employee benefit plan and boost their coverage by offering a tax credit of 25% of the cost of additional mental health coverage for the first three years. We're going to provide $115 million over three years in grants to nonprofits and charities delivering mental health and wellness programming. We're going to create a national and nationwide three-digit suicide prevention hotline. We're going to make the single largest investment in Canadian history for mental health support for Indigenous people by providing a billion dollars over five years to boost funding for Indigenous mental health and drug treatment programs, including providing culturally appropriate supports. We're coming with a very ambitious plan. We're very, we're very motivated and, and, and excited about it, and uh, we're coming to help. Okay. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Joel. That's great. Um, Kamal, we'd love to hear from you about an NDP government and how that might uh, deal with the mental health crisis that's facing Canadians. Thank you. Um, this is a personal issue to me. I, I have ADD and I, you know, I, I, it's very important that mental health supports are available. Um, I know a lot of people emailed me about MS supports and uh, NDP wants to create a pilot program for workers with episodic illnesses and disease disabilities to access EI sickness benefits um, one day at a time. And we want to make a basic living income for disabled Canadians. We want to have pharma care, uh, better long-term care, and continue research on how to improve mental health supports for all Canadians. 
and uh, that would be paid for because I know somebody asked me by uh, increasing the corporate taxes of specifically large businesses as well as a wealth tax and also following through on trying to find people with Panama Papers like people who have uh, wealth in other countries. Thank you very much, Kamal. Yara, we would like to hear what a liberal government would do to support mental health. Uh, go ahead. Thank you, Andrew. So the liberal government since 2015 has made strong commitments towards um, mental health, and it started initially with its staged process through recognizing the needs for assistance for community programs on substance abuse and local community mental health organizations. But during the pandemic, we really stepped up with the Wellness Together program, ensuring that every Canadian who needed direct access to services had them with a psychologist, with a therapist when needed. We also mentored funding to Kids Help Phone so that our young people also had access to mental health care during the past 18 months. But it didn't stop there. We committed to a billion dollars in mental health supports in our budget that, would, that was passed just this past May and early June. And we look at mental health from a holistic approach because that's the way mental health is health. And you can't just look at it through one silo of simply passing health transfers to the provinces. We have to look at it in terms of all the pieces of the puzzle, supportive housing, addiction services, training and, and, and social services as well. And that's why the package that we've put forward on mental health looks at all the pieces of a person's life to ensure that there's mental health literacy in our communities across Canada and access to the resources and services that they need. We'll be expanding and growing them under that billion dollar commitment to start and much more to come. Okay, thank you. So I, I just wanna take a second here and commend all three of you because uh, it was wonderful to hear such comprehensive uh, policy discussion. Um, uh, really impressive that all three parties have done all of this thinking about uh, how to support mental health, which is a, a really serious issue. Everybody has 30 seconds to respond, of course, now, and that's kind of when the gloves come off, um, which is all right. Joel, uh, you have 30 seconds to respond. W what is your reaction? Well, Yara, if you cared about these important issues, we would not be in the midst of an unnecessary election. Instead of this $660 million value project for Justin Trudeau, our government should be working towards developing a co comprehensive mental health strategy. It should be implementing one, and you, you had every opportunity, opportunity to do so. Six years, uh, your mandate of almost a year, and now uh, I, he I hear what I hear is fantastic speaking points from you um, that echo the same type of blah blah that I hear from the from 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 Justin Trudeau. But of course, the big concern is the implementation. It has it's never happened. It hasn't okay. happened. Before. All right, thanks, Joel. Um, Kamal, you're next. Yeah, thank you, Yar. Thank you, everyone, and and especially Yar. I think that, like, yeah, you said pieces. We have been trying to cover the pieces, but for me, um, the pieces have not been covered. And I can tell you this is personally that I have not been able to upgrade my medication to a new medicine because my therapist, who I pay out of pocket for, won't is not able to do that, and my doctors will not do that unless I go to a specialist. And that specialist won't see me until I pay for another, a second psychological assessment, which I already did. Okay, thanks very much, Kamal. Yara? I'll keep it short as the co-chair to the All-Party Mental Health Caucus, where we will work across party lines. Six billion dollars in mental health transfers in the coming few years. The Wellness Together program expanding from coast to coast to coast to coast, and a comprehensive strategy that includes all aspects of mental health for Canadians going forward. So uh, one, I'm just looking in the chat, of course, to see if there's any new questions. Um, uh, again, again, you're welcome to put anything you want in the chat, everyone, but uh, if you, the most useful thing is to put questions that I can put to the candidates. Uh, so let's talk about guns. Let's talk about guns. There was a question in the chat earlier about guns. Um, what is your party's policy on guns in urban centers and what is your party's policy on various types of semi-automatic rifles? Um, Kamal, you're first. Um, <coughs> our, our party policy on guns is to, you know, I mean, well, actually before I even talk about that, I think that 
what what's important to look at is where are these guns coming from and the majority of the guns are actually coming from across the border they're not coming from people who have gotten licenses and who um and um i'll be honest i don't know enough about the actual policy actually well you know because too many lives have been lost in canadian cities to these rising gun crimes and um, I want to work to keep the assault weapons and illegal handguns off our streets and to tackle gun smuggling and organized crime. That's, that's our position. I'm on mute once again. It's the coughing attack. Sorry about that, folks. Um, Joel, you're you're next, and uh, so I'll give you a second to take yourself off mute. Um, don't make the same mistake I made. Uh, um, good thing I'm not running for office. Uh, so go ahead. You've got two minutes to talk about your party's policy on guns. Yeah. Well, while while I was you know canvassing with masks, uh, forced to canvass in this uh, fourth wave uh, across York Center. Um, um, uh, in this unnecessary election. Um, what was stark to me is that there are many areas of York Center where people just basically know that they're not safe and where, uh, you know, we, we can't, we, we shouldn't be knocking after 8 p.m. at night because they are scared. Um, what, what the practical reality is, is gun violence has actually risen under the trudeau Yarosak re liberal regime. Um, uh, uh, again, we, we, we talked about the, the IRGC and, you know, terrorism being, uh, being uh, non, IRGC not being on the list, terrorism being on the uh, free for all for terrorism in Canada, uh, a lack of seriousness in terms of tackling ga ga uh, gang violence. Um, uh, in terms of guns, of course, uh, our leader has been very, very clear. We're going to maintain the gun ban uh, that is in place. But we're going to do a lot to help uh, secure our future. We're going to provide $100 million over five years uh, to support, uh, to, to support uh, uh, anti-gang violence, uh, cybersecurity, online offenses. We're going to hire more police officers, 200, RC, 200, 200 further RCMP officers to combat gang and the smuggling of guns. And Kamal was right. The practical reality is that the, the guns that are used in the streets of York Center are coming in from the U.S., uh, border and the practical reality is that the uh, Justin Trudeau had six years to work on this and obviously if you look at the statistics uh, things have not improved things are worsened with respect to gun smuggling in the in the country. Thank you, Joel. Uh, Yara, you have two minutes now to talk about what a liberal government would do about guns. So in Israeli, I have a deep um, understanding of what it means to have a gun and fire a gun. And, and I know unequivocally that they have no place on our streets. We can't give into the gun lobby here in Canada and have an Americanization of gun culture. And we, that's why we ban guns, and these guns, and we're going to keep them banned as opposed to the flip-flopping that we've heard from the conservatives on that, on the conservatives on that, because we have to make sure that they can't get into the hands of people who would want to come and shoot folks at a church or at a synagogue. But we're going to grab, crack down on high capacity magazines because no gun should be able to fire more than five rounds. We want to combat gender-based violence and that includes gun smuggling and lifetime background checks for those who are abusers to ensure that they can't get their hands on firearms. We want, to get, we want to ensure that there are red flag laws to ensure that firearms don't go into the hands of people who are a potential threat. Police and border services know exactly what it means to have this and the, they need the capacity to combat firearm smuggling. I know that the conservatives, particularly those in Toronto, don't want to get rid of guns because their platform specifically says that they will legalize the types of guns that were used in mass shootings, including the Tree of Life massacre in Pittsburgh. Kamal, you have 30 seconds uh, to respond to the other candidates. Go ahead. Thank you. And uh, thank you, Joel, for bringing up the, the point on gangs. And yeah, we need to protect our communities against gangs. Uh, I'll make sure that our communities have access to funding for anti-gang projects that will help deter at-risk youth from joining gangs. 
And, um, you know, I, I know you are mentioned like, yeah, I've never fired a gun before, but we need to have people who have an open mind and who will listen to multiple perspectives. So thank you. Thank you, Kamal. Joel, 30 seconds. I think it's irresponsible for Yara to conflate mass shootings with, uh, with, uh, with, with, with people who look like me. I mean, that's the practical reality, um, you know, um, and, and I just, I just, I just you know, as a person of color, I just find it offensive. Um, we're going to maintain the gun, gun ban. We've been very clear about this. Uh, and in her response, I, I've heard nothing about owning up to the responsibility in relation to the failures with CBSA. Uh, in relation to the guns coming in from uh, from the United States. I've heard nothing about amending the criminal code in terms of uh, uh, going after the gangs. And again, if, if there's all this work to be done, why are we in this unnecessary election? No answer in relation to that. Sorry, Joel, you're done. Okay, Yara, 30 seconds. Thanks, Andrew. So let's be clear, we need a member of parliament who will stand up for this community and stand up to our values, which is saying no to bringing guns into our streets. I can say that the Liberal Party and myself and our Liberal Caucus believe in that unequivocally and do not hang out with the gun lobby. I can't say the same for the Conservatives and many of their colleagues. Okay. So last question, uh, and then we'll move to closing statements. The last question, we've, there's been a, I've tried to cobble this question together because there's been a series of them in the chat. But the last question I think is a, is a question that's really important to everybody in Canada, which is the economy and the budget. So the, the questions have been versions of every party's plans seem to, in, seem to have a lot of spending involved, and none of them seem to be worried particularly about balancing the budget. So we'd be interested in hearing what's, the, what's your party's plan to grow the economy and what's your party's plan to balance the budget. Yara, two minutes. Thanks, Andrew. So, you know, first and foremost, we knew that emergency supports, supports like CERB and wage subsidy and so on that we had to throw at the pandemic during this time to keep Canadians safe, to ensure that there was food on the table and a roof over their head. These were smart spends because it meant that we were protecting businesses and protecting families to ensure that there wouldn't be deep economic scarring as a result of doing nothing. But now we have to move forward and we have to build back better and we know that and that's why we're looking to pivot towards a green economy and green innovation but we also have checked every line item of our budget with the parliamentary budgetary officer who has ensured us that we will be at 0.8 gdp deficit by 2026 based on tax capture and revenues as we bring canadians back to work which are coming back to work already we've seen the job numbers we know that from the million jobs lost from covid Pre-COVID, we're back up to 750 and higher from the recent reports, and we're moving forward with the economy. That being said, we know that we also need to invest to go forward, which is why we put, again, a budget in front of the parliamentary budgetary officer to make sure that the spends that we do going forward make sense. Inflation that we've seen over this time in part has to do with many things like climate change. When there are droughts, when there are fires, when there are hurricanes, food supply chains are, are limited which means that we need to attack climate change in order to bolster our economy. So green innovation, green tech, moving us forward in a just transition with a planned budget with pre-deficit spending by 0.8 GDP by 2026 is the plan and I stand behind it. Thank you, Yara. Joel, what's the Conservative Party's plan um, to grow the economy and to balance the budget? Um, obviously, the you know ideally the budget could have been balanced uh, tomorrow, but that's certainly not going to happen. I mean, the practical reality is that uh, Ontario, which was, used to be the king of manufacturing, is is the king no more, um, and and that, and and that's basically uh, the practical reality that 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 uh, came about during Justin Trudeau's uh, six years as a, as a Liberal Prime Minister. Um, the, 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 the balance, the budget is going to be balanced. It's going to, ha it's going to happen over many years, but what's important is that we have a very different vision as, as to how to get the economy restarted, kickstarted. Instead of, uh, instead of investing in the, uh, in the Facebooks and the, the Amazons and all the big boxes and whatever, 
what we're coming with a, con a concrete plan to get Main Street, Main Street going, uh, going again. Uh, we're, we're coming with the HSD holiday only for, re for, for, for our local retailers. That's going to make a huge difference. That 13% is, is the margins because our main streets have been absolutely decimated. We're coming with uh, uh, new mortgage rules that's going to allow millennials to get into home ownership. Um, and that's going to allow for new amortization. Um, we're coming with wage subsidies, and that's going to make a huge difference as well. 25%, 50% of support that's going to go to the employers so that people can work again. I should tell you that 20 years ago, it's that type of wage subsidy that got me my first job. Uh, I worked for someone for two years and I've been uh, on my own ever since, and that, that, that made a huge difference. So these are concrete plans that are, that are coming about, and they're going to make a huge difference in relation to Main Street, which is what, I, what, what I'm not hearing at all from, uh, from the Yarosak, Justin Trudeau liberals who would rather spend your, your, your money on an, on, on an unnecessary election, $660 million. Kamal? You have two minutes. Let's talk about what an NDP government would do to grow the economy and to balance the budget. Thank you. Yeah, I'm, I'm a small business owner myself, so it, it baffles me how irresponsible some governments can be and they, you know, when they don't even have the guts to raise their own revenues. Um, we want to have a wealth tax for people over $10 million, and we want to raise the corporate tax rate to the 2010 rate for large companies only. Um, of the three, of the three of us here, our costed plan actually has been costed to have the lowest deficit. So we would be fighting against unique things like tax shelters and Panama Papers and our no strings attached uh, tax cuts that liberals and conservative governments have handed out to profitable corporations have not translated into more business investment or good jobs for Canadians. Growing the economy by investing in green infrastructure you know, we'd be creating jobs by investing in priorities such as community infrastructure and transit, affordable housing, energy efficient retrofits, farm care, long term care, training, and more. Like, we need to raise revenues. Okay. Thank you very much, Kamal. Um, 30 second response for everybody. Yara, you're first. So I'd like to talk about the incredible investments in business that we've done here in York Center over this time, whether it's through manufacturers um, who are, are, are building motherboards here for an international market, whether it's in, in Downsview, the new uh, film industry and new studios that are going to create 9,000 jobs, or whether it's the 450 million that we invested in Sinopi for vaccine production. We're already making the investments for the economy to move forward with good paying jobs, and we'll continue to do so. Thank you, Yara. Joel, you have 30 seconds. You know, I ask again, why are we in the midst of an election instead of working on behalf of Canadians? Why are we in the midst of an unnecessary election? We're in the midst of a fourth wave of COVID. Our economy is just starting to rebound, and here we are in the middle of an election. Your government just introduced a budget, yet here we are in the most expensive value project for Justin Trudeau that we've seen in his six years of power. Why? Why this election? You're talking about 7,000 film jobs. You can't, you, you can't film, you can't produce films. And how many people in New York Center actually are in the film business? Uh, I'm, I'm a television producer, perhaps just me. It's, uh, thanks, thanks, Joel. Taking things seriously, obviously. Um, Kamal, last word is to you. Yeah, thank you. And, you know, I... I agree, like our, our liberal government opened a $150 million aerospace school in 2019, and then literally months later, allowed the runway to be sold. Uh, hello, like if you're talking about controlling your spending, you need to make sure that you start here. We need to start in York Center. That's just down the street for me, so thank you. Thank you. Okay, so we're gonna get to the last part of the evening, which is closing statements. And, uh, we are going to have each candidate, um, we're running a little over time. So if I would ask you to maybe try and keep it to two and a half minutes, but I will not cut you off until three. Um, so uh, we are gonna finish in the same order that we started. So Yara, three minutes closing statement, um, make the case to your voters about why they should uh, reelect the Liberal government, go ahead. Thanks, Andrew, and thank you to Nabrath, and thanks to the other candidates and everyone for taking part in this tonight. Hopefully after tonight's debate, you know a little bit more about who I am, what drives me, and why I want to continue to be your MP. On Israel and anti-Semitism, I am who I am, unequivocally clear and unapologetic Zionist, 
and a strong advocate to fight anti-Semitism. As a dual Israeli-Canadian Zionist who believes in strong relations between Canada and Israel, I'm fighting anti-Semitism here in the community and also hate and discrimination loudly and proudly. I know your concerns, I've lived them with you and I won't back down being a fierce defender for our community here in York Center, which I call home. But I can also say that Joel the same way about Israel and that both of us and our parties are strong friends of Israel and the Jewish community and it saddens me and disappoints me that he continues to try and create a wedge on this issue in our own community. So if your one issue is Israel and are supporting the Jewish community, you have lots of allies on the screen. But this election is about so much more than that. We have a choice about what the kind of country we want and the community that we want to build together in the emerging future from this pandemic for ourselves, for our children, for our grandchildren. We've seen the impacts on our healthcare, on our seniors, on our families and our children, and we have to work together to build back. I'm running on a platform of vaccinations, on improving healthcare, on better pensions for seniors, on $10 a day childcare, on tackling housing affordability and on upping our fight against climate change, because these things matter. And I hope you will vote for a candidate and a government that supports them. I wanna close by bringing some perspective to all of this. Each of us is up here on the screen. Each of us up here believes in a better community and a better Canada. We're all here for the right reasons. I hope that tonight I've given you some reasons and reassurances why I think I'm the best choice in your riding and want to continue as your MP. I'll hope you can consider what I've said and what our platform says and reach out to me if you have more questions. And even if you don't vote for me, I'll work just as hard to make sure that you're represented because that's what our democracy is about. And I know how to approach this job. Thank you to B'nai B'rith. And thank you to Andrew for taking making this available in the time. And Shana Tova, Metuka, Gmar Khatimatova, Lukulam on Mishbachot Shalachem, Shana Tovat and Gmar Tov to everyone here and to your families. Thank you, Yara. Joel, um, you're next, and uh, this is your opportunity to make a case for replacing the government with a conservative government. So uh, you have two and a half minutes, but I'll give you up to three. Go ahead. The Liberals of Justin Trudeau, Jenica Atwin, and Yara Sachs are all talk and no action. Uh, being an, an unapologetic Zionist means Yerushalayim shall have Jerusalem gates of gold when you have an opportunity to be a, a normal a, a people like every other people, like Ben Gurion said, and to have a, a city that hosts all the embassies of the, of, of, of the country and to have uh, the opportunity to have the Canadian embassy uh, uh, seated in Yerushalayim and you stand against that and you object to that, that is not an unapologetic Zionist. You are, it is not an unapologetic Zionist, Zionist uh, a, a, a member of parliament who embraces the anti-Semitism of, of Jenica Atwin. It is not an unapologetic Zionist who uh, allows and who doesn't, who doesn't, who doesn't, who doesn't make every, every effort to get the Revolutionary Guard put on that, uh, on, on that terror list. It is not a, an unapologetic Zionist who continues and who supports three months uh, after being elected in office, $90 million over three years of, of funding of UNRWA. Uh, Yara was speaking about uh, working on their curricula. To this day, their books are full of anti-Semitic vitriol that, that says the worst about us and, 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 and the worst untruths about our people. And it is absolutely unacceptable. It is not an unapologetic Zionist who, 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 who erases all, all her tweets and who thinks it's flippant and funny to uh, the BDS ban on, 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 ben and, uh, uh, on Airbnb. Uh, and I've certainly heard nothing from, from Yara Sachs in relation to the BDS ban of, of Ben and Jerry's. Uh, it is just constant, constant. And the practical reality is that York Center, being an MP for York Center, meaning used to mean uh, a, a fiduciary relationship, a, a community trust. Uh, Ken, Dryden, Ken Dryden, Mark Adler, a Ken Dryden liberal, Mark Adler conservative, Michael Levitt, um, Michael Levitt left, uh, left caucus and is now able to uh, serve the Jewish community. And I don't think, I, I don't think, uh, uh, he, he would have stood for what, what, I, what, what, what we've seen uh, over, over these many, many months. Uh, York Center is a fragile ecosystem, and there's only, two, there's only two paths in relation to preserving and enhancing our Jewish community and our Jewish presence here in York Center. Um, the economy, uh, the affordability, and uh, factors which we've, we, which we've talked about, and tackling on anti-Semitism. Anti anti 
and, uh, and, and being strong in relation to that. The election is close. I need you to come out uh, uh, and we need to do this for our children, for our parents, for our grandparents. Uh, if you want to stand up against anti-Semitism and not be an apologist uh, who, who embraces Jenica Atwin, if you believe in the economic recovery, if we weren't going to turn from this terrible chapter, we, we Okay, to... Joel, sorry, if you hit the full three and I don't Thank need you. to cut you off. We really appreciate hearing from you. Thank you. Um, Kamal, you get the last word once again. Yeah, thank you. Um, thank you for hosting this. And I, you know, I, one thing that really baffles me about housing is that I was the only candidate here to attend the Downsea Housing Referendum. I was the only one. Um, you know, families and owners should be valued over landlords and investors. We need accountability in government today. And our, our current government has no commitment to do what's right. I, I really think that personally, you know, the pharma care, universal health care, Long-term care and, and child care are super important. Um, but uh, you know, I, before we head out, I, I wanted to stress again very seriously that under this government, there has been a rise of anti-Semitism and race-based hate in this riding, targeting Jewish community, Muslim community, Black community, and Indigenous community. And we've seen liberals, we've seen conservatives, and it's been bad and worse but we could have better. So let's, let's get better. I'm ready for better. Okay, well, that wraps it up for everybody this evening. Um, I'm gonna make, I'm gonna say a few thank yous. First of all, thank you to B'nai B'rith for providing this forum. I found it extremely educational. And although um, I'm in Eglinton Lawrence, just south of the riding, um, I'm, I'm hoping that our viewers tonight were able to, uh, help them, uh, sorry, I'm, help, I'm hoping that our panelists tonight were able to help our viewers crystallize their decisions. Everybody's got a decision to make. Um, thank you to the uh, people who put questions in the chat box. Uh, we really appreciate it. I thought that they were very, very good and insightful questions that really struck at the heart of what's at issue in this election. So I thank you. Um, a uh, little slightly less thank you for those of you who put vitriol in the chat box, um, but I understand politics raises uh, emotions and maybe it should raise emotions. We're very lucky in this country. We're, 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 some, of the, uh, we're some of the small population of this planet that gets to decide who governs us. And that is something that we should never ever take for granted. Uh, I also wanna thank our candidates. Uh, I wanna thank our candidates for attending tonight, but I also wanna thank our candidates for putting themselves out there. Uh, running for office is an incredibly brave thing to do, and I, you know, personally want to thank all three of you because it's a it's a wonderful thing to do to serve your country. So, uh, thank you very much. Good luck to all three of you in the upcoming election, um, and uh, we'll all be watching carefully uh, next week to see uh, who comes out on top. So, have a great night. Good luck, Shana Tovan, Gamartov. That's all for tonight. Thanks, everybody.